right shoulder even a little further if you can. And then gently release the stretch, bring your head back to the center. Let those neck muscles in the back relax. Come up to the center. And we're going to do three to the left. We're going to inhale, exhale through pursed lips as you look over your left shoulder. Inhale, exhale, round those lips like you were blowing a whistle. Breathe naturally, but look even a little further if you can, without straining, shouldn't hurt, and gently roll your head back down to the center. Two more times. The next time we're going to exhale with a shh, inhale, exhale, Look a little further. Anybody coming? And just release the stretch. Release your head. Roll back to the center. And one more time. I think one way to stay motivated about exercises as we do these exercises tonight, I'll try to remind you of something that you do every day in your life that uses these same movements. All right, one more time. We're going to inhale. And as you exhale over your left shoulder, we're going to exhale with the palm. Get around your lips. You look great. Inhale up. Exhale down. That's three. Three more, then we'll add our voice. Inhale up. Exhale down. Feel those abs contract. Two more. Inhale up. All the way to your ears. And then release all those neck and shoulder muscles down. I should see them. E. It's an E. 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 Shoulder level. Raise up. Okay, I'm telling you, lower down. <laughs> oh. 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 
come just to your shoulders, not higher. Oh. 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 So I'll just emphasize, vocal glides are a great speech, voice, and swallowing exercise. They lift our larynx, our voice box. That's an important position when we're swallowing. They stretch and shorten the vocal folds that often become stiff with Parkinson's. So it's a stretch for the vocal folds. We're almost done with our warm up. We're going to inhale arms up over our head as we exhale. We're going to exhale with an ah. It doesn't have to be a real loud ah, but open your mouth, relax your jaw. Remember your breath will support your voice. Inhale up. Exhale down. Ah. So this time, as we inhale, our arms will come up over our head. We're going to exhale with an ah. It doesn't have to be real loud, but relax your jaw. Open your mouth. Remember, your breath will support your voice. Inhale, up. Exhale, down. Ah. That big lateral stretch again. We're going to exhale down with an E. Stretch it out. Exhale down. E. Let me see your teeth. E. Good. We're going to inhale. Left arm's going to come up over our head. We're going to exhale down with an I. Exhale down. Arms are going to come up chest level with a stretch to the side. Inhale up. Exhale. Hold the stretch. And one last time, we're going to clasp our hands in the middle. We're going to inhale, stretch up high over our heads. Exhale down with the knee. Inhale up. Release the breath, release your voice. Great. Now that you're warmed up, are you ready to power up your voice? Wow, I wish you could see how you looked from this vantage point and sounded. You sounded great. And that's one of the things I noticed, particularly with choral work tend to get better as you go along. You sort of pick up the energy of the group. And seeing all those arms moving was very nice. OK. So it's stalled here. OK. So why the focus on breathing? Uh, and what does that have to do with the voice? and speech and swallowing. And I would just say it has everything to do uh, with those functions. So you might be surprised, if you're 70 years or older, that you've already taken 600 million breaths. Isn't that amazing? When I made that slide the first time, I thought that was pretty amazing, that with no instruction from us, 
We wake up every morning and we go to bed every night. You can count on that, that you will keep breathing. So every breath in and out of our body passes through our vocal folds, which are housed within our larynx. The vocal folds vibrate for voice. That's sort of what we know about them. But actually, they're a valve. And that's a way to think about them. Because as a valve, they sit right at the top of the windpipe. And their main role during swallowing is to protect our windpipe from anything getting into it. So every breath is in and out of our, uh, between our vocal folds. When we inspire, when we take the breath in, our diaphragm, which is a muscle, contracts. Our lungs expand, just like two balloons, and fill up with air. And then on exhalation, which is usually passive, meaning it usually shouldn't take a lot of work on our part, the lungs spring back or recoil. So just like a stretchy balloon, they recoil, allowing us to exhale. And then during exercise, speech breathing, during singing, we engage those abdominal muscles to help support the breath out. The abdominal muscles are the primary muscles then of exhalation. The larynx is the primary muscle of voice. And a healthy voice, a healthy sounding voice, is produced when the vocal folds are just barely touching. And that's what the voice scientists have taught us. So if the vocal folds are too far apart, as often happens with Parkinson's, they get stiff and they don't come together, uh, they, don't, they don't vibrate together uh, well, voice will sound breathy. It may sound low-pitched because the vocal folds aren't able to make contact. If the vocal folds are too tight, as they sometimes can be with a spastic disorder, sometimes can happen with PSP. The voice sounds strained or tight. So too loose, too stiff, too open, or too tight, neither is a good condition. So the best position is when the vocal folds are barely touching. And they were barely touching when you vocalized mm. We're always speaking on the breath out. So we're always breathing in and out. Again, no instruction from us. But now, during speech, we're actually using that breath stream out, using it as a source of airflow to the vocal folds, setting them into motion so that we have voice. Now, what a lot of people don't always know, including some physicians, I might add, uh, is that breathing and swallowing are reciprocal functions. So by that, I mean we're always doing one or the other. We can't do them at the same time. And in fact, if we try to, what do you think is going to happen? We choke. So that's really a simple way of understanding what aspiration is. Some of you may have heard that word. Some of you may have had a swallow study because you were choking. And the speech pathologist said you were aspirating. That's really a simple way of thinking about what aspiration is. It means that something in the timing between breathing and swallowing got off, got discoordinated, because we're always breathing or swallowing. And we also use the expiratory muscles, primarily the abdominal muscles, when we cough. <coughs> and so if I am working with someone who has any type of a neuromuscular disease or weakness in those muscles, Cough effort and cough power is often a problem. Uh, with regards to timing of breathing and swallowing, uh, an example I often would use with nurses when I would be uh, doing an in-service for nurses and trying to help them understand about swallowing problems would be if I uh, got onto a treadmill right now or a stair climbing machine and I started really going on it and now my, my heart rate was up and my respiratory rate was up. And <laughs> Jeff came over and said, Mary, here, take a glass of water. What would I do? What would I intuitively say to him? I'd say, wait a minute, I got to catch my breath. I have to catch my breath. So imagine how silly a notion it is to think that if you've got some breathing problems, you're already breathing pretty fast or pretty weak or pretty shallow, that now you're going to try to time that 
with swallowing. Breathing always wins. Breathing always wins. We're designed that way. It's either a great design or a lousy design. Depends on how you look at it, but that's the way we're designed. We're always doing one or the other. So a number of researchers in my field, uh, including Dr. Roxanne Diaz-Gross, who I uh, mentioned up here. Uh, Roxanne is a friend and a colleague of mine in Pittsburgh. And in 2008, she published a study in a swallowing journal where she looked at individuals, adults with Parkinson's, and healthy adults, match, same age, and looked at their swallow function, in particular because of her interest, her research interest is how breathing interacts with swallowing. She looked at them on a video swallow study to really understand the dynamics. And what she found was that many of the people with Parkinson's swallowed too late. So what does that mean? Normally when we swallow, whether it's our own saliva, a sip of water, or food, for that second or two or three that we swallow or it takes for us to swallow, we're holding our breath. And we're holding our breath because the vocal cords, that valve, is closed. Happens automatically, happens when the brain stem sends the message down to all the muscles. But we have to be able to hold our breath. So we hold our breath mid-exhalation. So we pause the breath out, swallow, and then as we resume exhalation, it helps kick any material that might be up in our throat out of the way so that it doesn't get into our airway. But if you have stiff respiratory muscles from Parkinson's, if you have poor breath support, uh, weak respiratory function from COPD or asthma, you may need a breath before you finish the swallow. And so what happens? You inspire, you take a breath too soon, and you choke or you aspirate. Um, so it's really disorganization between breathing and swallowing that often is at the root of a lot of swallowing problems for people, not only with Parkinson's, but with other kinds of neuromuscular, neurogenic um, diseases. Uh, and then down here, I just mentioned another study that was sort of a recent study um, where they looked again at what might be some other problems that might be predictors of swallowing problems uh, and a change in a decline in cognitive function and a decline in postural stability. So people who are reporting falls um, may also be people who we should have a suspicion that they may have some swallowing problems. And I'll, I just want to interject here. Remember that, that very small show of hands of who was referred for speech therapy. I, I have a slide, I don't have it in this presentation, uh, that I often use, or a little photo I often use, and it's a cat burglar. It's actually a little cat, but he's dressed up like a burglar. But a cat burglar. Because when you think about a cat burglar, they're sneaky, aren't they? They're sneaking around. They're out there getting ready to break into your house. You don't see them, but they're out there. And that's really very much how I think of speech and swallowing problems associated with Parkinson's. They're sneaky, they're insidious. It's not like someone you may have known who had a stroke, and the day of the stroke or the day after, suddenly there was a change, a dramatic change in speech or voice or swallowing. This is sneaky changes. And so uh, there was a study that was done that uh, actually uh, asked individuals with Parkinson's, how many of you think that you have a swallowing problem? And only a third of the respondents indicated that they thought they had a swallowing problem. And then the researchers looked at that same group of people using an x-ray of video swallow study, and guess what? Three quarters of them actually had a swallowing problem. So when I uh, get a referral from a local neurologist and I call the person up to schedule an appointment, introduce myself, and the voice on the other end of the phone says, um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't really think my speech is that bad yet. I, I, I don't really think I, I need speech yet. I'm uh, always thinking and then ask, huh, okay, so I'm just curious, when do you think you might be ready? <laughs> like what symptoms are you waiting for uh, before you ask your physician for a referral? Um, so again, keep in mind those changes are happening uh, and so just like with 
uh, big muscles, the sooner you incorporate some strengthening exercise uh, to preserve that function, the better off. So accurate coordination between breathing and swallowing is really becoming a strong interest among swallowing researchers who also have an interest in Parkinson's disease. I already mentioned that exhaling after the swallow, actually, actually continuing to exhale uh, after the swallow, can serve as an important clearance mechanism to move stuff out of the way. If you ate a crumbly cookie and you've got little crumbs here in your throat, uh, it may help to brush them out of the way before they have an opportunity to drop into your airway. And strengthening the muscles of exhalation, again, primarily the abdominal muscles, may also improve cough effort. And cough is really our best defense against pneumonia and aspiration pneumonia uh, because it's how our bodies clear mucus and material from our lungs. So on the right here, uh, you're right, you see uh, two types of respiratory muscle strength trainers. And respiratory muscle strength trainers have been around for a long time. They're not new devices. Uh, but primarily they have been indicated or used with people who have breathing problems, COPD or asthma. Um, and so that's what many of the studies and the research um, discuss. But they are exercise devices. You can think of them like weight training for your uh, breathing muscles. Uh, again, they are different designs. Uh, many of them are designed only to strengthen the muscles of inspiration, the breath in. Others are designed to strengthen the muscles of exhalation, the breath out. And then the one at the top, the breather, uh, is designed to strengthen the inspiratory and the expiratory muscles. Uh, so I'm going to just show you really briefly how they work. Uh, so this is the breather, the one at the top. And I realize people way in the back may not be able to uh, see very well. Uh, this is an inspiratory, expiratory resistive respiratory muscle strength trainer. So it has dials on it, and as I turn the dials, I make it easier or harder to blow in or suck the breath, uh, take a breath in or exhale. And so you could kind of think of it like inhaling and exhaling through straws that are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so now, as I make that space for airflow smaller, the muscles have to work harder against it. So every breath is in and out of, through the device. Mine, uh, you know, travels with me a lot, so it's a little noisy. And if you were up here and had your hands on my abs, you would feel, particularly on exhalation, that they're really tight, uh, that those are the muscles that really are being worked. And so as time goes on, set up a schedule so that, just like with weightlifting, you're going to higher resistance to make the muscles work harder. Uh, this device, so this is a resistive respiratory muscle strength trainer. This is a spring-loaded threshold device. This is the EMST-150, which was designed by some um, researchers at University of Florida. This one was designed by a respiratory therapist in Orlando. Uh, and so this one is a little bit different. Uh, so this has a valve, which has to be kind of opened. Uh, and uh, I think of it kind of like a weight machine that has a pin in it, a Nautilus machine. And I set that pin to 20 pounds, and it takes a certain amount of effort to lift that, that weight. It uh, comes with nose clips to just direct all the airflow through your mouth and not out your nose. Now, some, I can't always do it, so I hope I can. <laughs> I hope I haven't set it low enough. So you can see how I'm using it. <laughs> um, the University of Florida researchers, uh, particularly Chris Sapienza, who's a speech-language pathologist, have begun to publish a few small studies, particularly looking at the use of respiratory, their respiratory muscle trainer uh, and swallowing function. Uh, and their early studies indicate that, in fact, expiratory muscle strength training can improve swallowing function. Uh, and what they're identifying is that it helps to lift the larynx. So when we exhale against resistance, it helps to lift our voice box. That's an important position during a normal swallow, keeps it closer to the structures above and protect our airway. And also, primarily, uh, they're looking at improved cough effort. 
Uh, so again, that ability to cough and to clear material out of our lungs. When I have a patient referred to me, uh, as I did last week, um, who comes to me because they've had a swallow study at a local hospital and a small amount of aspiration was noted, uh, and the patient is sent home with a recommendation to put thickener in their liquids, which they're not happy about and are barely doing. Um, my uh, feeling about all of that is the most important thing I can teach that person to do and the most important they can thing they can commit to do is respiratory muscle strength training. Because we all aspirate from time to time, meaning we all have episodes of something going down the wrong pipe, but we don't get pneumonia. You get pneumonia when you're sick from another disease, when those muscles are really weak, when you don't have good cough effort and power and you can't clear the accumulated material out of your lungs. So I think that that's really